All right, this is the lecture on the nervous system. And on this lecture, we're going to be talking about neuron communication. All right, so one thing to know about neurons is that they are electrically excitable. And it's not just neurons that do this. It's actually neurons and muscle fibers. They are both electrically excitable. Now, there are two types of signals that we're going to go over. One is called a local or graded potential. The older term is graded. So you'll probably hear me talk about both of them, um, use of both of those terms. Um, now, a couple characteristics of local potentials is that what happens is that you get a small deviation from the resting membrane potential along the plasma membrane of that neuron. So it starts out at resting membrane potential. We've talked about that one before. And what we're going to see is a small deviation. So not the entire plasma membrane, but just part of the plasma membrane. What will happen is usually it'll spread along that plasma membrane and then die out. Now, local potentials almost, given what I just told you, almost seem like they're false starts. Yeah, they can be false starts. However, local potentials can also prompt that neuron to do something. So they're not kind of, they're not only just false starts, they can have an effect on that neuron. Something else to know about a local or graded potential is that it may trigger an action potential. So what is an action potential? An action potential is a brief, complete reversal on the charge on the plasma membrane. So if you think of the polarity on the plasma membrane, it's going to have a reversal in the polarity. It's going to have a charge change. And this is the entire, for an action potential, this is going to happen throughout the entire plasma membrane. Now, action potentials result in long distance communication in the body. So physically long distance communication in the body. Now, both potentials, whether it's the local or the action potential, rely on the resting membrane potential of these cells. Remember, we did talk about the resting membrane potential. And with the resting membrane potential, you have more positive ions on the outside of that cell than you do on the inside of the cell. The inside, just to the inside of that plasma membrane, we're going to see an overall net negative charge, as opposed to on the outside of that cell, where we're going to have a more positive charge. That's our resting membrane potential. Now, even our resting membrane potential relies on specific types of ion channels. That makes sense because if we're going to have ions flowing from one side of a plasma membrane to the other, those ions are going to go through the ion channels. Now, these ion channels are going to open and close in response to various stimuli. So there has to be a stimulus that acts on the plasma membrane of that cell opens up the ion channel and get those ions to flow. Okay, I have a short video for you to watch on uh, potentials, an action potential. The shortest one I could possibly find that is that is pretty good on showing the charge on the plasma membrane um, during an action potential. if we can get it to load. A nerve impulse is an electrical current that travels along dendrites or axons due to ions moving through voltage-gated channels in the neuron's plasma membrane. 
Voltage gated channels open and close in response to an electrical voltage, so they are affected by changes in electrical charge around them. When a neuron is at rest, a charge difference is maintained between the inside and outside of the cell. This charge difference is produced and maintained largely by active transport using sodium potassium pumps. The pumps send sodium ions out of the cell and bring potassium ions in. While other channels allow some flow of potassium ions back out of the cell, the sodium ions cannot easily get back in to replace the lost positive charges. The overall result is that the exterior of the cell has a net positive charge and the interior has a net negative charge. The difference in charge between the interior and exterior of the cell is called the resting membrane potential. A nerve impulse begins when a stimulus disturbs the plasma membrane on a dendrite, causing sodium channels to open. Sodium ions flow into the cell, lessening the charge difference at that location. If the change is enough, it will cause nearby voltage-gated sodium channels to open. This allows so many sodium ions to flood into the cell at that location that the membrane there is depolarized with the local region inside the cell having a net positive charge and the outside of the cell having a net negative charge. This affects neighboring voltage-gated sodium channels which then open, moving the depolarization along the membrane. This moving depolarization is called an action potential. Changes occur behind the action potential to restore the resting membrane potential. The voltage-gated sodium channels close and voltage-gated <laughs> potassium channels open. This allows a rapid flow of potassium ions out of the cell, repolarizing the membrane so that the inside is again negative and the outside positive. This is followed by use of sodium-potassium pumps to fully restore the resting membrane potential and to re-establish proper concentrations of sodium and potassium ions inside and outside the cell. All right, so hopefully that animation um, helped you out. Now, I really like animations as far as physiology goes because, you know, me talking about it or you reading it in a textbook or even me drawing things on the board or you looking at pictures, it's hard to understand what's going on in those dynamic worlds. Um, so whenever you can, watch an animation on whatever topic that is, uh, especially when it has to do with physiology. Okay, now you have a better understanding of what an action potential is, and we're going to talk about the phases of an action potential. So there are certain phases of an action potential. Now, this graph over here, so I want you to know this graph. Now, what this is, so watch the cursor. On these axis points, um, on this axis, we have voltage, and that is in millivolts. And what this is, if we were to take a, a little voltmeter and be able to put it into the, uh, through a cell, through the plasma membrane, and, and just right to the inside of that plasma membrane, into that cell, this is what we would see. Okay? This is how we would graph it out. So, we have a voltage, okay? And this is over time. And this is milliseconds. It's okay. Now, at resting membrane potential, remember, that little voltmeter is right inside the plasma membrane into the cell, where it's more negative. During resting membrane potential, the inside of that plasma membrane, the, or I should say the inside of that cell, just to the inside of that plasma membrane, is going to have a net negative charge. Outside, it's going to have more sodium ions, so it's going to be more positive. Okay, so if we look right here where the cursor is, it's about negative 70. Negative 70 millivolts at resting membrane potential. Okay, so resting membrane potential here. 
Now, at some point, this neuron has to receive a stimulus. A stimulus is going to prompt ion channels to open. Ions are going to flow, and we're going to start to see a change in the charge of the plasma membrane. Now, I know this particular picture has numbers on it. <clears throat> so, for your notes, you can number those as well. We're going to number num we're going to put number one as a stimulus. So the neuron is experiencing a stimulus. Now, the more of a stimulus, what we're going to see is the more ion channels are stimulated, and therefore more ions are going to flow. If we have enough of a change, it will hit what we call threshold point. The threshold point for a neuron is about negative 55 millivolts. So if it reaches threshold, then what we're going to see is a complete reversal of the polarity on that plasma membrane. And we call that an action potential. So threshold is this point right here negative 55, and if it exceeds threshold, the entire plasma membrane will depolarize. So we have number two depolarization. So number two depolarization, and when the plasma membrane is depolarizing, the plasma membrane becomes less negative and more positive. So it becomes less negative and more positive. That makes sense. We're getting more, more and more positive here to a point where there, if you watch the cursor at the very top here, the entire plasma membrane has been depolarized. And if we're still checking the voltage, we're at 40, about 40. All right, once the entire plasma membrane has depolarized, what happens is the ions start rushing in back, okay, and we're going to get a repolarization. So during repolarization, the plasma membrane becomes more negative and less positive. So during repolarization, more negative and less positive. They're rushing in the opposite direction now, kind of going back to where it will, heading back towards the resting membrane potential. Okay, we're undergoing repolarization, repolarization, the ions are flowing. Here we go, ions are still flowing. Oh, they keep going, they keep going. They kind of overshoot their target. And that overshooting the target makes it go even more negative, right? So it's making that plasma membrane go even more negative. And we call that hyperpolarization. So when it goes more negative than resting membrane potential, that's called hyperpolarization. So eventually, it'll even back out to resting membrane potential, back over there to negative 70. Okay, now once that plasma membrane hits the resting membrane potential again at around negative 70. If there is another stimulus, it can now respond. It cannot respond to any more stimulus while it's repolarizing or hyperpolarizing. We call that the refractory period. So the repolarization and hyperpolarization. So if I drew a line here, like okay, repolarization, hyperpolarization. Here's my other line. All this area in here is going to be the refractory period. What does it mean to be in refractory? It means the cell cannot respond to any new stimuli. There could be more stimuli on that cell. Can't respond. It can only respond again when it hits that resting state. 
that resting membrane potential. Then we're back over here again. Once it hits there and we have another stimulus, it can undergo another action potential and reverse that polarity on the plasma membrane. Okay, so a stimulus is going to act on that neuron. We know this. Once that stimulus acts on the neuron, it's going to prompt ion channels to open up. It's a flow of ions from one side of the plasma membrane to the other side of that plasma membrane that gives it that electrical current. So now we want to talk about the ion channels. And there are uh, four different types of ion channels that I want you to know. The first type is called a leaky or a leak or passive. Now what's significant about them? These are usually always open, okay, and it allows ions to pass. If we're looking at the picture, it's the bottom left, okay, this kind is always open. Something else to note about this type is that they're usually really specific to the ion. So for example, potassium channels. You're seeing one here, a potassium channel, a sodium channel. Okay, they can be leaky, always open, allowing, ion, allowing ions to pass. Easiest type of special ion channel to remember. Another type of ion channel is called a ligand or chemically gated. A ligand or chemically gated. With this one, you want to think a molecule. Remember, we talk about chemicals, and we don't really refer to chemicals on the inside of the body. We typically call those molecules. So, this type opens and closes in response to a molecule binding to a receptor. Okay, it'll bind to a receptor, which in turn will open up an ion channel. So, take a look at the top left. So, a ligand gated or chemically gated. <clears throat> we have a molecule that's going to bind to a receptor, which is going to open up the ion channel and get those ions to flow. Which type of molecules do this in our body? Well, I'm going to give you some examples. Hormones are types that can do that, neurotransmitters, and some ions. So what they can do is they bind to a receptor on the outside of the cell, which in turn opens up an ion channel, which gets ions to flow. Now, one of these, neurotransmitter. We need to talk a little bit more about neurotransmitters and what they are. Neurotransmitters are a chemical released by a neuron that excites or inhibits other neurons or effector cells. That's the classical definition. So it is a molecule released by a neuron that excites or inhibits other neurons. That makes sense. But we do want to know what an effector cell is. That means it can be other types of cells like muscle fibers. They can be uh, glands, cells of glands. Um, that's what we are referring to when we say effector cells. So release from a neuron. So let's say that neuron is experiencing an action potential. And that neuron has to tell the neighboring cell what to do. And what it's going to do is it can release a neurotransmitter. Think of neurotransmitters as the language of neurons. They are converting, the neuron has converted electrical energy to chemical energy. Electrical energy from the action potential that is now turned into or released a neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter can get a neighboring cell to depolarize, to have another action potential. So think of it in a way as this is how the neuro neurons talk to each other and talk to other cells. The three most common neurotransmitters in our body are acetylcholine, dopamine, and norepinephrine. This little picture here is showing acetylcholine. 
If I had to pick one neurotransmitter that we talk about the most in class, it's going to be acetylcholine. I found this little picture, it's a cute little picture, shows the molecular um, structure of acetylcholine. You don't have to know that. I just thought it was a neat little picture to have up. Okay, another type is mechanically gated. So mechanically gated ion channels. These open up, open and close in response to mechanical stimulation. So what do I mean by mechanical stimulation? These would be things like pressure waves, sound waves, force, physical force, or even tissue stretching. If we think about touch receptors or pressure receptors, this is how they work. Mechanical, when you see mechanical, it means something's moving. Take a look at the top right. Think of this as a pressure uh, receptor in your skin. All right, so if we, or, or a deep touch receptor works the same way. If we're going to touch something, we're going to activate the receptor. In order to, and then what we do, my cursor, this thing, we've distorted part of the plasma membrane on that receptor. So we pushed on it and distorted it. That distortion is going to open up an ion channel. It'll open up that ion channel and get ions to flow. Okay, fourth one. Oh. Oops. Oh. The fourth one is voltage gated. So voltage gated ion channels. They open in response to a change in membrane potential. They give an electrical charge change, right? A voltage. So a voltage change in the plasma membrane. This is mainly the way action potentials spread along neurons. So if we remember the little video that you watched, the animation, it was spreading along the plasma membrane. So if you have a voltage charge change that is spreading along the plasma membrane of that neuron, that change in charge is going to activate neighboring ion channels. Going to get those neighboring ion channels to open up, ions to flow, we get a voltage change, which in turn activates neighboring voltage gated ion channels. So think about it, that's how it spreads along the plasma membrane. So voltage gated ion channels open in response to a change in that membrane potential. They open in response to a voltage change. And that's how action potentials spread along the plasma membrane. Next thing we're going to talk about is propagation. So what is propagation? It's the spread of the action potential from the trigger zone to the terminals in a neuron. So if we, this is going to rely on us knowing parts of the neuron. You guys studied parts of the neuron in um, lab, so you should know this. Just a quick review, if we're looking at this as our neuron, typical neuron, this part over here, here's our dendrites. Here's our cell body or stoma, right? Here's our axon axon terminals. All right, the input region for a neuron is the, is the dendrites or the cell body. This is where the stimulus is going to act on for the most part. This portion right here between the cell body and the axon, that is called the axon hillock. The axon hillock is the trigger zone. So if enough stimuli act on this neuron in order to depolarize the cell body, and the dendrites, and to get to this point, that is called the trigger zone. If it gets to that point, what will happen is an action potential will spread along the axon, and you will have your full action potential. Okay, so propagation. Propagation also includes conduction of these nerve impulses, so we're going to talk about that. There are two types of conduction. We have continuous conduction and saltatory conduction. Looking at the, the picture on the left. <clears throat> continuous and saltatory. Now, continuous conduction. 
it occurs in non-myelinated axons, so no myelin. Continuous conduction is what we've been talking about. This is nothing new. So this is when you have voltage-gated ion channels that are stimulated, and it's going to spread along the axon, down the axon, and out the terminals, out all of the terminals at the same time. We just, now you have a name for it. It's called continuous conduction. We also have another type, and it's called saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction occurs in myelinated axons. You have learned about myelin in lab. Now, there are cells, special cells, that make up myelination. There are special cells that make up myelination in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, what's the name of the cell that makes up the myelin? If you said oligodendrocyte, you were right. It's oligodendrocytes. Okay, what's the name of the cell that makes up the myelin in the peripheral nervous system? Okay, we call those Schwann cells. Very good. Okay, so we know that the myelin is actually parts of other cells, or it might be the whole cell, depending on the location. Now, a myelinated axon. A myelinated axon. Saltatory conduction occurs in myelinated axons. Now, how this is way different is that, let's say, a stimulus axon, the dendrites. Okay, here's a stimulus. They act on the dendrite. Going to get the charge to change. It's going to spread along the soma, the body. Oh. And it gets to that axon hillock, the trigger zone, and starts to spread along the axon. In saltatory conduction, where we have myelin, the myelin does not con um, completely cover the axon. There are actually tiny openings that we call nodes. There's tiny openings between. What happens in a myelinated axon with saltatory conduction is that the action potential will spread from node to node. Node to node all the way down that myelinated axon until it reaches the terminals and then out the terminals. So to compare these two, this one is kind of like a gentle stroll down the axon. Continuous conduction is like a gentle stroll down the axon. Saltatory conduction is like it's skipping. All right, it skips down the axon. So if you have one person, two people right next to each other, one's going to gently stroll down the street, the other one's going to skip down the street. Which one is going to get there faster? The one that's skipping, of course, right? One that's skipping down. And so the saltatory conduction will actually get there faster. That action potential will actually get down here to the terminals much, much faster than in con continuous conduction. Pretty cool. Now this picture over here shows the difference between um, continuous conduction and saltatory conduction. And what you really want to know, right, is that with the myelin, it's going to go from node to node, skipping down the axon, and it will get there much faster. The action potential will get to the axon terminals much faster. So that brings us to talk about the myelin sheath, the function of that myelin sheath. You know what it is, but there are actually two functions of the myelin sheath. One, number one, is that will increase the speed increase the speed of that action potential. Now you know why. Okay, that one makes sense. Another function of the myelin sheath is electrical insulation. Okay, so let's talk about that. Electrical insulation. 
Let's talk for a minute about wires in a house. So way back when, when we first started wiring up houses for electricity, what they had to do was they wrapped those wires in fabric. Okay, so look at the pictures. This is fabric wa wrapped wire. Because if you put a wire into a house, you're going to run electricity through it. If it's not wrapped in something, if it's not insulated in something, then what's going to happen? You may have a lot of sparking, right? And it's going to burn your house down. Well, they wrapped it in fabric. So you might think, well, why in the world were they wrapping it in fabric? That's all they had. Okay, it was the best insulation at the time. Wrapped in fabric, and it did a really good job for many, many years. Now, every once in a while, we can still find an old house when they're restoring it that has the old wrapped wire. That fabric lasted a long time in those houses. Now, it was about 1950s when we got really good at producing plastic that they started wrapping these wires in plastic. So even today, they're wrapped in plastic. Um, now, these older homes that are, still have the fabric, after a while, of course, fabric is going to break down, and you're going to see starting to fray like that. And what happened, what do you think is going to happen when those old wires get frayed like that? The fabric gets frayed and opens up that wire. Those wires are running right by your house. I mean, scratch that. Your the wires are running right by the wood, okay, in the walls, and you have electricity flowing through them. Well, if they're not properly insulated, you're going to see a lot of sparking. That sparking, if you have too much sparking, could cause a fire in our house. All right, you guys get that. So they have to be insulated very well to maintain that electrical impulse that is traveling along the wire. Now let's think of this, have that in your mind, and let's jump back here to a neuron. Okay, and let's look, even look at this one. In a neuron that has myelin, the myelin is serving as electrical insulation. We have an electrical impulse traveling along an axon. Right? There's electrical impulse traveling along an axon. And just like the wires in your house, if we don't insulate them, we may have some sparking. Now, we like to look at these neurons as, or when you know the picture, or even when I, you know, draw it on the board, just that one neuron out by itself. That's not typically how we find a neuron in our body. These are going to be smack dab right next to other neurons. Right? right next to other wires. You can see lots of wires right there together. And if we increase the chances of sparking, that action potential may not get down to the axons, axon terminals. Okay? And we don't want a whole lot of sparking. Right? We like, we like them to be insulated. We like to completely have control and direct those action potentials to get it to that effector. So, what does the myelin sheath do for us, especially on our motor neurons, is that it will electrically insulate those charges, okay, those impulses. Electrically insulate them. So we have less, so we have less sparking, so to, so to speak. Now, you also learned that the myelin sheath increases the speed of the conduction, right? So it's a twofold. It increases the speed, it gets it where it needs to be very quickly, and it also electrically insulates it. All right, <clears throat> multiple sclerosis. I'll give you a little example. Multiple sclerosis, there are, very, there are a few different forms of multiple sclerosis. Um, in one form, you have damaged neurons. It causes damage to neurons. 
More specifically, what does it do? It causes the myelin sheath to get damaged. If you damage a myelin sheath, you're going to have what? Decreased speed, potentially decreased speed and the lack of electrical insulation. So let's look over here. We have exposing that axon. We have regions that are being exposed. We have a da damaged myelin. It's going to decrease the speed. It's also going to decrease the electrical insulation. So those action potentials aren't really getting where they need to go as efficiently as they once did. Okay? Then we start to have problems, physiological problems because of that. And in that particular disorder we call multiple sclerosis. Alright, the last thing that we're going to talk about for this lecture is a synapse. So what is a synapse? A synapse is a site of communication between two excitable cells. And like you learned at the beginning of the lecture, excitable cells can be neurons or muscle fibers. So more specifically, a synapse can be found between two neurons, a neuron and a muscle fiber, a muscle fiber and another muscle fiber. Okay? There are two types of synapses, electrical and chemical. We're going to start with the electrical first. Electrical synapses occur when you have action potentials conducted directly between adjacent cells by a gap junctions. So we have two cells right next to each other that have gap junctions. Remember when we talked about gap junctions, they were the communicating junctions. They allowed for ions to pass between two cells and one cell, let's look at this picture over here on the left, one cell will be experiencing an action potential spreading along the plasma membrane. Because it has gap junctions, which allows ions to pass from one cell to another, that can trigger an action potential in the neighboring cell. So one plasma membrane depolarizing, this whole cell is experiencing an action potential, ions flow through the gap junctions and it's going to trigger an action potential in this particular cell. That's called an electrical synapse. The second type of synapse is called a chemical synapse. A chemical synapse is when you have action potentials conducted cell to cell through what we call a synaptic cleft. And with the help of chemicals or molecules called neurotransmitters. Now, <clears throat> when you have neuron to neuron or neuron to a muscle fiber, you're, these cells do not touch each other. They come exceedingly close, but they do not touch. So one action potential has to be propagated to another cell without those cells even touching. And the gap between them, I shouldn't say gap, the space between them we call a synaptic cleft. A synaptic cleft is the open space between these cells. So if one neuron is talking to another neuron, they're going to come exceedingly close, but they're not going to touch. There's going to be a small space in there called the synaptic cleft. One neuron has to tell another neuron that it needs to depolarize. How it's going to do that is via a neurotransmitter. So neurotransmitters are at work during a chemical synapse. Okay? Oh, oh there we go. Hold on. Uh, here we go back. Alright, so in a chemical synapse, it requires a synaptic cleft and a neurotransmitter. Electrical synapses are between two adjacent cells that are tied together with a gap junction. One place where we find electrical 
synapses is in cardiac muscle fibers. Okay, so how your heart contracts spreads from cell to cell to cell to cell through the muscle fibers. And guess what? Those cardiac muscle fibers have, are tied together via gap junctions. So one cell will depolarize, which will cause the adjacent cell to depolarize, which then cause the adjacent cell to depolarize, and on down the line until your heart contracts. Okay? A chemical synapse is going to occur between two neurons or a neuron and a muscle fiber. And they're going to require a neurotransmitter. All right, that's it of today's lecture. I hope you learned something, of course, and hope you were taking notes. Um, and that is it. Thanks for paying attention.